This video was put together for the fans of Tyler Perry's Ruthless TV show for entertainment and informational purposes only. Welcome back to another episode of Ruthless TV, where I break down Tyler Perry's hit cable series, Ruthless, scene by scene. Now, today's video is going to be a little bit different. I've come across more than a few Facebook posts Facebook comments and other videos as it relates to Tyler Perry and if the cult life that he speaks about on this drama series deals with real cult life. And in this video, I'd like to show you the comparisons and what I've discovered, what may have inspired Tyler Perry to write the series Ruthless. There are so many other videos and articles that talk about um, the comparisons, but I just wanted to make a video to kind of uh, as an extension of what's already out there. The very reason why I watched the show to begin with is because of a personal experience that I had in becoming aware of the Nuwabian Nation and what they were all about. And no, I was not in a cult, never been in a cult, and will never join a cult. And I think that this is where uh, some of the problem lies in where most people don't join cults. They join churches, they join religious organizations, political movements and intelligence, you know, things of the like. So I don't really think that people will willingly join cults and the cult life and the activity that, they're, uh, that they end up being involved in. And if you chronicle some of the real life stories about cults, then you'll see that this is not how it usually starts out. So the Nuwabian Nation is a, or was a cult that started in Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York, and it ended up in Edenton, Georgia back on May 8th, 2002. They would preach black power and they would usually, you know, prey upon the downtrodden and those that had lost hope or those without hope. I had a friend that I would oftentimes invite her to church, like for years, I would invite her to my church and she would never come. Um, I'd always invite her and I would speak about the Lord, you know, quite often. And I always encourage her to pray and to read her Bible in hopes that one day she would come to church with me, but it never happened. And then one day she came over and she was all ecstatic about um, finding a church. And, you know, she was very excited about, um, you know, being able to worship somewhere. Right. So she was telling me about the church. Well, she didn't say church. She kept speaking of it as a temple. She would speak about how nice and cordial everyone was. And she also spoke about the preacher, but again, they didn't call him a preacher. She would always speak about him as a leader. She would say the leader. So of course, uh, she spoke so well of these people. I would ask her, you know, well, who is the leader and who is this pastor of, you know, this organization that you're talking about? And so she goes, well, I'll just go and grab the information that they gave me because I'm not, you know, quite sure of the names and everything. So she went over and she grabbed the information and then she said, look, this is the leader. And on the pamphlet, uh, it was Dwight York's picture on the front, but she didn't say Dwight York though. She rattled off some other name. It was a name that I couldn't even pronounce. So again, she went on to explain how powerful his messages were, how intelligent he was, and how gorgeous he was. And uh, she bragged about how all the women wanted to be near him and how all the men respected him and so on and so forth. And I you know, thought that was a little bit strange that she would be speaking of a pastor or a leader in that way, you know, talking about how women want to sleep with him. And if you're just visiting a church or new to a church, it's very weird that that would be the topic of conversation and that you would, you know, be privy to that conversation. Regardless of how long you're, you've been there, it's still a bit weird. And she had so many booklets and pamphlets and flyers and paperback books and <laughs> you name it, she had it. And again, I was thinking to myself, you know, that's a lot of information to give someone who's just visiting your church. I mean, when we go to church, we usually just get a program and a fan and that's it. So to make this long story short, um, she did invite me to the church or the temple as she called it. She would tell me how people would gather outside, 
how beautiful the buildings were, the rich, bright, colorful uh, paintings, and I mean, all kinds of stuff. And she even spoke about uh, some type of, uh, you know, I guess buildings or structures that look like pyramids. And what really put the nail in the coffin for me is when she told me that um, they would carry the leader in on this carpet thing or this uh, some type of chair. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I don't know what you call it, but they carried him in. You know, about six men would carry him in on this carpet thing like Aladdin, you know, before he would speak to the people. And that's when I turned to her and I said, look, you know, this is a cult. And, and I told her, you know, straight up, I, I could recognize a lot of the red flags, you know, as she was talking to me, but you know, I don't judge people for what they believe. And again, these, you know, organizations don't usually start off as cults. They start off as churches. And then it, you know, the leader or the, the person who's in charge, you know, their minds will get twisted. They get paranoid or they get, you know, full of themselves, whatever it is. And then it just goes awry from there. And on the left side, we see the highest from the Ruthless TV show being carried in under the pavilion to a church service or some type of meeting that he's holding with the Rakadushi members. And we have the members, the men members carrying him in to the service on this chair. And of course, on the right side, it's uh, Dwight York. And I'm not sure if uh, this is one of his services where he was carried in or about to be carried in, but it's, a sim it's the only picture that I could find that mimicked what my friend told me that she saw. And there are so many um, testimonials out um, that are, you know, where people are talking about their experience inside the cults. Um, I like to talk about Ruby Garnett and Nikki Lopez. Um, there is, a, a, you know, some documentaries that I had to pay for to look at. So I can't really share a lot of their testimonies or their pictures or video, but I can speak about it. And Ruby Garnett spoke of um, how they were all placed in communal housing and how the kids would be separated. You know, they, would, they wouldn't live with their parents. They would be separated and live in different quarters. Um, they would be separated to go to school and the women would work in the offices and the men would go out to recruit new members, pretty much like it is on Ruthless. Um, the kids stay in a totally separate trailer than their moms or their dads. And, um, you know, again, also the women work on the compound and the men will go out to recruit new members. So on the left side, we see the, the kids that are cast on the Ruthless TV show. And on the right side is an actual photo from the cult kids. And I'll leave links um, to the photos and to um, some of the articles and also some of the video footage that I found to put this video together. It'll be all in the description. And as you can see, Tyler Perry mimicked these um, actual photos to a T. And Ruby even talked about um, her being 14 years old and sitting inside of a beauty salon when someone approached her, someone from the, the, uh, the Nuwabian camp, and he was dressed in all white. He had on flowy garbs. Um, he smelled really good. And he gave her this book. And, um, you know, he recruited her, basically took her to the place where the leader was speaking. And from there, she was hooked. She mentioned that she dropped out of school at 16 to join the community. Notice she says community, not cult. She talked about the women and what they all would wear. They would have their heads covered, their faces covered, and how they pretty much all fell under York's spell. And then Nikki Lopez, um, she was born Christian and um, her mom converted to Islam and then they joined the, the community when she was just 11 years old. And of course the cult or the community promised to take care of them, to provide shelter, food, work, and this is all in exchange for him to have complete control over their lives. And if we go over to the ruthless side, you know, they take care of each other. Most of them, all of them have given the, the highest, their belongings, their homes, their money, their cars, um, everything. 
On the left side here, we see Ruth and Tally walking through the compound in their infamous purple cloaks versus on the right side, we see the all white cloaks worn by members of the Nuwabian nation. And of course, we can clearly see the resemblances here. And even on a recent episode of The Oval, which is, uh, which is where Ruthless spun off from. <laughs> so on that episode, we see Callie, who is Ruth's daughter, being exchanged for money. She's basically selling Callie back to her father so that um, Barry will give her the money over that she earned while she was out in the free world. So she wants to give this money to the Rakadushis. And, you know, it's pretty much just like Andrew did. He gave over his uh, pension, his money. All of the money was going to the compound as opposed to going back to his wife and his kid. On the left, we see Sarah, who's Andrew's wife. And in this scene, she's confronting Mac, who's Andrew's boss. Um, and she's basically very upset because Andrew has given all of their money over to the compound, his pension, all of his paychecks. They're just going to the compound. They were no longer coming to her and her son. And she was very concerned. And this is when she was addressing Mac in his office. And then on the right side, we see two members of the People's Temple um, that was headed by Jim Jones Church. And these two members actually had some type of um, social security benefits. And the guy on the right side is actually interviewing the lady on the left. And a lot of times people would want to know if they wanted to come home or if they were being held against their will. So the People's Temple members would often do these interviews with each other to, you know, let the world know that they didn't want to come home, they were just fine, and this is one of those interviews. And I say that they were receiving social security benefits because they are of a certain age and Jim Jones would um, have these people sign over their social security benefits to their church. Um, and not just um, elderly members, there were um, younger people, married couples um, that would, you know, sign their checks over to the temple. And, uh, you know, this is how they would live their lives. And um, Jim Jones, of course, in exchange, would take care of everybody. So this is one of the ways that um, the compound was being funded is through the members of the church um, who had basically given their financial rights over to him. They talked about how York was their savior and um, how he was a prophet and how they wanted to sleep with York. And again, it goes back to the ruthless part where we see Melinda who's very anxious, anxious to sleep with the highest and to have his baby. Now, in York's camp, the favorites, the people, the women that he would favorite, he would invite them to join the family as his wife. So this is where it kind of, you know, there may be a difference because I don't think that the highest wants a wife or, you know, Ruth may be changing all of that, but <laughs> I don't know, you know, we'll have to wait to see. But anyway, this was like a great gift for the women. They would love to sleep with him and they would love to be his concubine. And Ruby Garnett was just 19 years old when she was asked to, to join as a wife. And um, again, it goes back to Melinda. I think Melinda's only, what, 18 or 19 right now? And she's very anxious to sleep with him. And this is where how they compare in this aspect. And when Ruby became his wife, um, she was tested. She was tested a lot. And we do know that if we look at, you know, any episode of Ruthless, you will see members of the cult being tested over and over and over again. The one that sticks out in my mind right now is, of course, Andrew, because he's gone through so many tests. Daikon has tested him so much. Ruth has also gone through so many tests. So this is how they compare. And um, Ruby mentioned her test, um, and she thought that she was being tested when she had to witness her husband, who was York, um, basically have relations with an underage girl and I think the girl was like maybe 14 or 15 and Ruby really didn't know 
how to take it and she thought she was being tested so that's when she you know the red flag started to go off for her and she wanted to that I think that's when she started to prepare to leave the um, the cult and let me also state that in one of Ruby's interviews, she mentioned that, um, you know, when she was performing one of her duties as a sister wife, I think they maybe they were in their folding clothes or something. But anyway, her daughter, uh, the other the sister wife's daughter was like five years old and she ran in into the room with them and she was screaming. She was hysterical, just screaming at the top of her lungs that Papa, I think that they called him Papa or Daddy or something, you know, had his genital in my mouth Uh, I've got chills just thinking about it right now and saying it um but yeah she said the five-year-old ran in there in the room with them and said that to them and the little girl was crying hysterical just couldn't catch her breath and just really out of it and um this was another incident that disturbed her to the core to where she just she couldn't take it anymore this is the event that actually um was the straw that broke the camel's back and she left that's when she actually left the cult all right another aspect that we can compare is york he was involved in a lot of criminal activity just the same as the highest is he was being funded or the compound was being funded by Lilo who was in the cartel so we're talking human trafficking drug trafficking and just all kinds of illegal things and this is how uh, their lifestyles were supported York's criminal activity involved counterfeit checks bank robberies and just other organized crime and this is how his organization was funded And, um, you know, of course, he was running from the FBI and law enforcement when they moved down to Eatonton, Georgia. And it kind of goes back to, again, comparing it to Ruthless, how um, one of the cult members was in the, the market and he was telling Dale how they moved around so much that they don't stay in one place for long. So that was their MO. You know, they'd, you know, I guess, you know, do a crime and leave. (laughs) So York wanted to form their own nation and he moved down to Edenton, Georgia. There was about, um, he moved on to um, 400 acres of land and which was surrounded by a uh, national forest. And it was pretty much isolated and that was very much a factor. And they were not subject to any laws of the United States of America and that was his goal. He would tell his members that the government would target them if they continued the Islamic practice. So this is how he was able to change everyone's religion and their belief and their practices over to whatever he believed. So this is, again, where the conflict comes in, because initially it was just a community or, you know, a church or a place that they would commune to learn about, you know, their blackness and their true leadership. But then it changed to something else. Once he got them out of New York and got them to um, Georgia in the middle of the woods, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, he changed up, you know, he switched up, which is just like Jim Jones did. And he's another cult leader that I'm going to make a lot of comparisons to. And I think that this is pretty much the base of Ruthless, the TV show, because there are so many comparisons there. This is just the tip of the iceberg, guys. And again, um, there are so many documentaries out there. And I'll say this again, because I made this video for Ruthless fans, because we do enjoy the show so much. And we watch it, we comment on it, we make videos and posts and, and all the things. But this is real life for some people or it was real life for some people and of course um the guy you know york was later arrested you know for um you know a lot of had a lot of charges against him but one of in particular being you know having sex with underage girls so and i know a lot of people were asking you know is this based on a true story and you know this is again what prompted me to do the videos because the videos are so dark you guys you know just you know going over this information gathering the information talking about it putting the you know the slides together you know writing down what i wanted to say it's just is really really dark and it's draining <laughs> to be honest with you but i thought that it would be um a really good tool for us to compare when we're watching the show and just know that you know tyler perry did a great phenomenal job in bringing this to light you know to bring something you know that's so dark 
to a place that's entertaining, you know, but you're still, you know, putting the truth in there. So this is why I'm doing the videos. It's 100% for Ruthless fans. It's not to degrade anyone. It's not to judge anyone. Um, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, show you guys what I found. All right. So this is the end of part one. And then I'll do a part two. And hopefully that'll be the end. But Jim Jones and uh, Ruthless Compound had a lot, a lot, a lot of comparisons. So hopefully it will be um, just as short as this one or shorter. Okay. So thanks for listening. And I'll see you on the next video.